Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, it's great to see uh, such a good turnout out here, uh, especially at one o'clock on the Tuesday for, for this talk. But I think that uh, you all, there's been a lot of buzz at Rice about this talk, and then it's good that it's translated into people in the room. Um, this is actually an important subject, and so our, our speaker today, our very special guest from Boston College, is going to enlighten us, as he's done for the last two days, about a great many things, uh, in particular about science and uh, building trust relationships with not just the science community, but beyond the science community, which is actually a very big uh, thrust for our university. Um, and just to, if you don't know who I am, which some of you may not, I am uh, Paul Cherry-Curry, I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Biosciences and Bioengineering. Uh, and what our, our focus is on, we, we actually have many thrusts, but one of them is a STEM uh, outreach program, which is the IUB Girls STEM Initiative, which Mike is, uh, has been gracious enough to work with us on, and we're, we're developing some new programs in that, that area. But we're also trying to develop more community relationships, because that is one of the one of the uh, things that Faye Lebron has talked about for Rice, and uh, by engaging with experts in the field, we think we can learn from others beyond our borders. Uh, and so that's why Mike has been uh, good enough to share his experiences, and they've been quite challenging at times. <laughs> We've learned a lot, and it's, uh, it's, it's just been a great pleasure the last two days, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to have more interactions over, over the coming years. So um, I think you all read his bio, so I'm going to get out of the way so that he can, he can talk about uh, what he's uh, going to talk about today. And just to let you know, in full disclosure, we're, we're Facebook Live right now. So uh, any comments you make will be on the internet immediately. So just remember that. So be bold with your questions. It's good to be. Uh, be very public about it. We need to have an engaged conversation that's respectful, hopefully. And then uh, <laughs> be able to move forward. So with that, without that, any further ado, uh, Mike Martin. Oh, excellent. Great. Thank you, Paul. Great. Can folks hear me okay? All right. I can go into teacher voice mode as needed. Uh, I'm used to teaching a class that has 150 students, and none of them are ever this close. <laughs> yeah. So, well, thank you guys for hosting me. I've had a great time learning from you guys over the last you know, couple of days. You guys are doing some impressive and amazing work, and hopefully there'll be some intersection points. And hopefully what I'm about to say will be useful in some way. I value questions and discussion on anything that pops up on the slides. And as always, when you start a slide, the first question that you want to show, the first thing you want to show are kittens. Oh. <laughs> um, and then we take a little poll. So how many of you guys actually like milk? All right, keep those hands up. How many of you guys like kittens? <laughs> All right, some of you didn't raise your hands to kittens. <laughs> All right, come on, kittens and milk. All right, what's, what's up with this? So, um, now that the cats have invented the internet for us, we can find all sorts of cool pictures. Uh, and I'll wander around. I'm genetically incapable of standing still, so sorry for you guys here in the front row. I'll sometimes be behind you. I just can't help it. Um, why I have the kittens and the milk up here is around communication of science, we actually can learn a lot from what the milk industry did. And so there was this big issue that they had, particularly amongst teenage boys is milk consumption amongst teenage boys was falling through the floor. And so they were looking at it going, oh, great. Right? These folks are going to grow up. They're not going to drink milk. What are we going to do? So we need an advertising campaign to really get them excited to drink milk. So the first thing they came up with as they were re-looking re at this is they had always done those celebrity ads for a while, right? where you see folks with the little milk mustaches. Uh, they decided they wanted something new. So they went to Twitter. They go, everybody uses Twitter, right? Uh, as you can tell, this one had two retweets. <laughs> so probably wasn't the best avenue of approach. So then they go, OK, so maybe folks don't really understand that, or they don't want to be reminded that they have exams beforehand. <laughs> so maybe we won't drink the milk. So then they said, well, maybe they don't quite understand that milk is healthy for you. So they came up with this character. <laughs> to go, maybe we'll have a nurse that will help them explain nurses are warm and fuzzy and friendly and helpful. 
And they said, oh, yeah, that didn't work so much either. Then they finally said, all right, how about that celebrity thing again? So then they came up with this. <laughs> right? Now, if Wolver Reed says, drink milk, right, you're probably going to drink milk. Right? Because you don't want Wolverine mad at you, right? And a lot of the teenage boys jumped on this. And so what happened is that milk consumption amongst the teenage boys population that they were targeting basically doubled uh, under the Wolverine campaign. Right? Isn't that impressive? Just having Wolverine, right, do this. And, you know, I'm going to drink milk if Wolverine tells me to drink milk, right? I'll probably drink almost anything, right? <laughs> he said to drink it. Um, so the reason for this, and to set up the little uh, discussion here, was communication is hard and it's complicated. And there's lots of factors that come into play. Um, right? People have a very complex relationship with science, right? In many cases going through school, right? Science oftentimes is a subject they dread it, right? Man, got, is there any way I can get out of science class? Right? I teach a course at Boston College called Science for Future President. I have half the class are seniors because they've tried to put off their science class as long as they possibly could and now they need it to graduate because it's a core course. And then they look around and they go, physics, no, chemistry, no, hey, science for president, I might be able to do that one. Uh, so it's complicated. It's also influenced by the messenger. There's been lots of research on how do you communicate and, message, and messenger matters. So we're going to actually look at this and how it influences the response to the message based upon who the messenger is. And this is particularly true in science. All right, there we go. So, now that we've got all the cool introductions out of the way, and you'll see why we did that shortly as a communication issue, is everything that we're going to talk about today that's related to the work that we're about to present is I have a, just a fantastic team. Um, just like here, I have some fantastic students in my lab that work with me, and I have a wide range of faculty who work with me, ranging from counseling psychologists all the way through uh, social entrepreneurs who uh, work with us on our various projects. And so I wanted to have them up there. And of course, the graduate students and the undergraduates are the ones who actually do all the real work and get everything actually done. So let's talk about a problem. Has anybody seen this uh, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon? If not, you should just Google Calvin getting his brain filled up because it's actually a screen from his experience on what the school day is like. And so each little scene is him being, you know, he's a little robot and he's getting stomped on and then he falls asleep and then at the end of the day he feels like he's getting stuff poured into his head. And so just like in instruction is many cases how communication has been done in the past has been approached from a deficit model, kind of what it is that, you know, the person that you're trying to reach doesn't know. Right? And it's our job to tell lots of facts and information and get it out to them. Because if they had the whole story, right, they'll be more receptive to the message. Um, and generally, that doesn't work. Part of the reason why, we're going to see why, is the perception of scientists around their trustworthiness. Is There's been a general belief that scientists are experts. Right? Society really deeply understands that the science community has a lot of expertise. The problem is they don't always trust them. And so why is that the case if they know that they have lots of expertise? I'm going to have to change my settings on my phone and keep falling asleep. So the reason behind this and the problem is, is that if the general public doesn't trust you, it's difficult to have sustained impactful policy impact because the senators and representatives, right, they listen to their constituents. And if their constituents don't really quite believe in what the scientist is saying, why should they? So we're going to explore some options around this. Uh, this was recognized uh, in a great keynote speech at the Communication Challenges in the Life Sciences. Uh, we're going to see a couple of resources that I highly recommend reading out of this conference. Um, and I had to highlight the word Trump <laughs> in there because he maybe had a precursor vision or something or other. But the red is one of the things that is important. It's that you know, people understand much of what we're saying and want to do, and he's talking about scientists, they don't like it. 
is that the conflict with their core values, and those values is what trumps what they're hearing. So then how can we manage to overcome that challenge? So let's look at some stuff. So there is lots of good news out there. So before we go all into this fondant land, which is pretty easy to do, <laughs> there's lots of good stuff out there. And so one of the nice findings is uh, um, Pew folks have done some excellent research on public perception around science. And they've been doing this research for a while. And generally, right, the science community is thought of positively. And it's been that way for quite some time. In fact, we're the third most confident in terms of institutional of uh, the organizations, military is number one, right? And science comes down as number three, right? And they tend to agree. Scientists are really helping solve really difficult problems, right? And they're really dedicated to helping people, right? And same, likewise, the NSF indicators, and that's uh, where this chart comes from, is found the same thing year after year after year. General confidence and belief that the science community itself is doing good and that they mean well. So we have this problem of why. Part of it is bad news slide number one, is there's a disconnect between what scientists believe and what the general population believes. This is a recent set of surveys from the uh, Pew Research Center. And I wanted to point out a couple of them up here. Is take a look at the biomedical sciences. That it's gotten a little blurry up there. So it says safe to eat genetically modified goods or modified foods. Notice AAAS scientists is on the right. General public is way over on the left. So there's a, dis there's a disconnect there in belief system. And that's what all of those little slides are. Climate change is the most famous one. There's a 37 point gap between what AAAS scientists think is going on and what the public believes. Right? And that's true across lots of these little variables. So there's this disconnect. And what this ends up playing into is there's been a fair bit of research that's done on this. This NRC book is a book that was published on building trust in the life sciences. It was the outcome of a Sackler Colloquium workshop on how do you communicate science to the public. Is they found that there's a lot of confidence in science, but not scientists. And so they're making that nuanced dis distinction between the two. Right? It's really interesting. So what we're going to explore is how can we bridge that gap. All right, doing okay? I am a teacher, so I always have to ask those questions. Right? And the worst thing you can ask is, are there any questions? Because there aren't ever any questions when you do it that way. <laughs> so what do scientists think is the problem? So again, Pew Research Study, they went and they looked at AAAS members and they looked at the general public. And so notice the first one up here. Scientists fault public knowledge, right? That they just don't know much about science, right? So it's not un so it's understandable why the premise of what we try to do as scientists is, you know, we get really excited, right? We're passionate about what we do, right? We really want to educate folks, and so we want to tell them everything we know, right? It's kind of dull, right? And it also comes apart as almost condescending in many ways. Is that I know it, you don't. Let me tell you, right? and. Notice the second one is news reports don't distinguish well-founded findings, right? So it's media's fault too, right? We're hearing a lot of that right now, right, at a presidential level. And so one of the books that I highly recommend, and there'll be a slide on it, is Don't Be Such a Scientist by Randy Olson. Uh, he does an excellent job of talking about how do you actually help a reporter understand what it is that you do. And he violates all the AAAS guidelines on how you talk about it, and we'll explore that. All right, next slide. There we go. All right, bad news part three. These slides stop. The bad news actually does stop after this one, I think. Um, so I'm going to slide up to here. So down there is where AAAS members are in terms of this ideological frame. So the y-axis is percent Republican as you head to the top, percent Democrat to the bottom, percent liberal to the left, percent conservative to the right. Right, the general population is a bit more conservative right, than we tend to believe. And notice the two quadrants here. AAAS members are way down here in the percent liberal and percent Democrat. General public is way over here. Okay? I highlighted it so it's a little skewed because I needed it to be, blow up and be red. Yeah. Oh, just to clarify and be sure, this is general American public. Yeah, general American public, yes. 
Yeah, because they're our Fox News viewers. <laughs> yeah, but they're up there, right? So we're actually dialectically opposed, right, from Fox News Tea parties down to the AAAS members, and this is all U.S. However, the same findings play out in the U.K. as there's been exactly similar studies that have happened there. I'm not familiar with other studies in other countries, but same data applies to the U.K. All right, so we're kind of not talking, but to each other. However, if we did want to find people that liked us, is the people that really like us. <laughs> <laughs> right, so go Trevor Noah, right? Him and the AAAS members are, you know, in sync with each other. So there's a problem, right? The typical Daily Show viewer isn't the general public in many ways, right? Is that they attract a very different type of audience. So how do we get to that other audience that's over there? So one of the models that we have learned out of social science and educational psychology and social cognition is this model called the stereotype content model. We'll just call it SCM because we're in an academic institution and we love our shortcuts and acronyms. So our SCM, it measures on just two really cool traits. It measures your warmth and it measures your competence. Okay. So on the bottom is the confidence, and on the y-axis is your warmth. And what you're looking at is it kind of is a measure of how harmful you might be to someone or how supportive and helpful you might be to someone. So if you're considered highly confident and warm, yeah, they're, they're, you're going to come across as a perception of being somebody that is excited to help you and you're very good at it. Right? If you're on the other side of it, considered on the incompetent side and not very warm, is they're going to go, ah, you basically get viewed with contempt. And we're going to look at a few slides on this. So this has become a very uh, hot area for research. Or, put another way, which is easier to remember, is would you rather be a Lisa Simpson, who is helpful, extremely intelligent, and patient, or if you look down on a diagonal mo? He might want to harm you, but he kind of lacks the basic competence to do so. <laughs> All right. Or Mr. Burns, right? He wants, might want to harm you, but he definitely could if he wanted to. And then Homer, right? Uh, and I like his little underlying thing. He's a lovable oaf whom you wouldn't want on your team under any circumstances. Right? I think that sums up the SCM model immensely well. And uh, the slides will be available, and I've put links to all the research papers where all of this stuff is coming from. So you guys, if you want to go look at the articles uh, later, they're all there. They're all open source for the most part. Now the challenge with this is when we begin to look at the world through this SCM model, it turns out that it's a very, very powerful influence is it deeply impacts because it's going after our implicit biases that we have and it's a good way of being able to visualize where those implicit biases exist. So there's a reason why you got to see something on the first slide. This plays out for those of you who are teaching uh, in the classroom all the time is students make up their decision about whether you are a good teacher or not typically within the first 30 seconds of the class. Is this was first found, let me bring it up, by Ann Baddy out at Stanford in 1993. It's called Thin Slice Psychology. It's a, it's a subfield of psychology. It's the idea of where first impressions come from. And so within 30 seconds, they make up your mind. What he did is he did a, a teacher evaluation after the first 30 seconds. And then, and he just did this on video. They didn't even have to be in a classroom. And he did it live. It's incredibly consistent. And then he looked at the teaching evaluations at the end of the semester. They were basically identical. And it was consistent across many faculty members. That's pretty impressive. So one of the things that you want to do at the start of classes is make everybody really happy. <laughs> right. So now you get to go think about those fuzzy kittens. right? So hopefully you've got to leave going, this is the greatest talk ever, right? because you started off with kittens. Okay. <laughs> Right, that's it, we're done. <laughs> Go from there. Uh, again, link to the article. Right. So, let's take this into a little bit more depth. So, this model really emerges out of the business and marketing community, right? Because there's a lot of money at stake on what people perceive your brand to be. 
And so um, up at the top is we've got some admiration and loyalty folks, which I was actually quite surprised, but you know, they spend a lot of money to make sure that this happens. Coke, Amazon.com, Hershey, Johnson & Johnson, Tropicana. I was very delighted to see Salvation Army, Boys and Girls Club, Habitat for Humanity, Humane Society, all high in the Admiration Society. All right. Then down there, the Contempt and Rejection model. Uh, well, you got BP. Uh, what's interesting about this data is it was collected immediately after the Gulf explosion. And so they actually have BP where they kind of waddle around down there for a little bit. They end up as far in the bottom left as you can. So this is a couple of months after it. So their opinion has moderated a little bit. But you've got all the other folks down there. And then you've got the envy and distress, Porsche, Rolls Royce, Rolex, Mercedes. Right. And this impacts on what you think about the brand, right? Is it a brand that you want to invest in? Is it a brand that you want to purchase, right? This is what marketers get paid the big bucks to be able to do to try to sway opinion, okay? Uh, then you have the core post office, <laughs> all right? And they end up in the upper quadrant where people really want to like them, but they don't see them as being very competent at what they do. So they're in the sympathy and neglect category. Uh, just like public transit, right? VA hospitals, Amtrak, right? So these are organizations that we would love to see do a really good job, but they're not. And so they actually end up losing support because they're in that category because people assume that they're not very good at it. So why should we support them, right? So. As we move on, all right, this is, I couldn't figure out how to make this one better without hiding all the words. This has been applied in multiple fields. So this graph actually shows uh, what people in the United States, and the same thing applies, this has been done worldwide, and the same findings pop out over and over again with you know, some variations. Is, this is with groups of people. So down here in the bias part is the contempt part. And uh, not confident, not warm, right? You've got the poor, uneducated, Muslims, right? You've got black, working class, Jews, Middle Eastern, lesbians, right? These, and you can see this play out in the media, right? Is these are easy populations to be, you know, set aside, you know, kind of marginalized, attacked because of all of the implicit biases that exist in the public around these issues. And so those guys are easy to attack. Um, one of the most fascinating studies is why was it so easy in the 1930s to set aside Jews as the ones for Germany to be the, the bad guys, right? It's because they fell down into this category. So it was very easy to rally folks against them. Um, then you have some other cool things. Is, whoops, uh, the Canadians. So anybody from Canada in here? Hey, there you go. You're awesome. <laughs> Right, is that we've got Canadians, right, middle class, educated students, right? Canadians are at the top, right? Is this is pretty recent data that was collected, so I leverage it to the Justin Trudeau effect because everybody just looks at them and kind of melts. Um, and so there he is up there. Um, but this is highly predictive over how somebody will look at a particular group. So what we're ramping up to is scientists and engineers, right? So this is professions, all right? So again, we've got competence on the x-axis and warmth on the y. Um, they're scientists on the warmth measure. Um, I put the red bar to roughly represent where the error bars was in the sampling size of the data. So also to show you kind of who scientists compare to um, we're about the we're in the same within air bars of a bus driver, uh, retail worker, cashier, waiter, landscaper, office clerk, uh, maid, janitor. Right, we're just above a factory worker, and yeah, police officers are within our air bars. Okay, so look at the folks that are below scientists, right? Taxi driver, garbage collector, right? Politician. <laughs> And then when you look at us where we are on the contempt or a competence side is we're way over here, right? And again, that plays in with a lot of the survey data that has already existed is that general public finds scientists extremely good at what they do, right? They're highly trained, very good at uh, their work. But do you like them? And so in order to be trusted, 
you need to be in that upper quadrant, right? That's why nurses are so high, right? <laughs> nurses are generally one of the most trusted professions in the US, along with teachers, which is surprisingly up there, given how much they get bashed over the, uh, uh, in the media. Right? Farmers, professor. I'm surprised professor was so high, actually. I thought it would be a little <laughs> bit lower. Um, so problem with that is that leads to trustworthy problems. Because if you're not somebody that is considered warm and approachable, right, you're kind of you know, yeah, I don't know if I want to 100% trust you. I know you're good at it, but maybe not so much. Okay. And so this actually begins to start to play out. And this is also where ideology comes into play, right? Is that we're in a, living in a very polarized country, right? We got about half of the folks are on left, half of the folks are on the right. Um, Nisbet and Fisk, two faculty members at the University of Wisconsin, and, and one's at Maryland now, have really done a lot of research on this. And what they found is they did a whole big survey, and one of the big surveys came out of uh, New Mexico, and that's what the top slide is. And what you're looking at is the blue is the Democrats, red are Republicans, and the purple are the independents. Okay? So notice over time, and notice where the percents are, right, is that Democrats end up being higher than Republicans, not a huge amount. Uh, but look what happens to the independents, right, is it starts to plummet. And given that about 40% of the population would consider themselves roughly independent, even if they're registered with one party or the other, now it gets down to about 50% and it hasn't come up from that point yet. Part of what they think as they were doing the research of that is residual effects over climate gate is that they felt that scientists were hiding something, right? And they wanted to know what it was. And so that stuff began, that stuff happened back in 2011, 2010, 20, 2009, but it takes time for that to really permeate, and then it's going to take time for it to permeate back out. And then down here on the bottom is out of, a, it, this one was published in a PNAS, uh, where scientists, would you tell the truth, is their perception for the general public. So if you're a scientist, will they tell me the truth? Uh, doctors got the highest, teachers, professors, judges, right? It's nice that we're not down at the bottom with pollsters, business leaders, <laughs> all right, trade unions, right? It's interesting that journalists are so low, right? Is that only 37% of the population will think of journalists will tell the truth? Scientists come in at about 61%. 16% of the population says they absolutely won't tell the truth. It is highly correlated in some ways to ideology, but ideology is, uh, comes in in an interesting way. Is if you tend to be more on the left, what they found is that Democrats, particularly those further along the liberal part of the spectrum, differentially prefer or are differential to science, whereas the conservatives tend not to be differential for science at all and tend to be extremely, extremely skeptical. And we'll see how that kind of plays out. And in fact, it turns out that the Democrats' preference or differential toward science is the anomaly, that the general public is more like the typical conservative. All right. Well, my phone reads, sets itself. Doing okay? All right. All right, Wolverine again. You know, I just wanted to have another Wolverine picture up there. Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's the secret of giving a talk is that oh, I needed a picture here and I couldn't think of one, so Wolverine is just cool. <laughs> so, a lot of our research that we do in our lab at BC focuses on effective outcomes. Is there's been a lot of recent findings that find that these non-cognitive factors, motivation, interest, resilience, persistence, motivation, tend to be better predictors of whether somebody will trust science, whether somebody will go into science, whether somebody, is in, whether somebody will pursue a STEM career, over achievement issues or you know, your grades in school. And so what folks are finding around this is in order for a scientist to really get their message across, they have to be perceived right, as sharing the person's values. Right? And so having a scientist from, say, Boston go talk to a group of people in Kentucky uh, may or may not be the best strategy. Finding a scientist in Kentucky to talk to Kentuckians, I'm from Kentucky so I can say it, is probably a better <laughs> approach because they would see that person as growing up you know, in their in their neck of the woods, so they probably have a similar value set. Right? Um, being fair, right? so being able to listen, 
That's the biggest thing that comes out in all the research is for the folks who say that they don't trust scientists, number one reason is they don't listen to me. <laughs> they just then just keep telling me what I should know and they don't actually listen. Um, and then where does science fit in society, right? And those are the one of some of the three things. Most importantly, willing to listen. All right, so what can we do? And so there's been lots of research that have come out over best ways to do this. And so there's a whole series of bullet points here. So one of the things is we just need to listen and try to understand where folks are coming from and their exact position and things like that, their belief structures. I often liken this to, if you guys haven't seen it, going off and watching the Private Universe videos. They're out of the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Is what they've done is, these are older now, but the exact same thing is true, and there's been like 5,000 research publications since the early 80s to, to verify it, is that kids, just like adults, were really good at coming up with explanations and models of the world. Right, the typical example that I, I use in class is, you know, if you were trying to explain to some, you know, five-year-old that the Earth goes around the sun, and you put them said, stand here and just watch the sun, right? And what they're going to see is they're going to see the sun go, and they did not move, right? But they saw the sun move. So you convinced them that they went around the sun, right? It's very hard, right? And so kids come up with an explanatory model over how that happens. Right, so the, the Private Universe series has a whole series of interviews with kids where they have misconceptions or alternative conceptions, depending on your language nowadays, <laughs> uh, about science, right, like plants, right? Kids make the assumption that plants get all of the, where they get their bark and all that matter comes from, from the soil and the water, right? But we're told over and over again in school that it's photosynthesis, it's photosynthesis. They take all that carbon from the atmosphere, they pack it all together, and that's where the plant mass comes from, right? But kids know, I water my plants. Has to be where the mass comes from, right? I'm putting stuff in, it grows, right? Makes perfect sense, right, when you think about it from a kid's perspective. If you as a teacher are not aware of those misconceptions coming in, the kids will leave with exactly the same ideas. And so what they did is they pre and post interviewed seventh graders, eighth graders, Harvard faculty members around reasons for the seasons. And you know, 21 out of 23 Harvard faculty members couldn't get it right. Um, and they repeated exactly the same thing that they would say in third grade. So then it makes you wonder, why did they go to school for all this? Uh, because the instruction did not take into account where the students were. And a lot of times in science communication, that's where we are. Anyway. So, let's, I found these, I love these. This is like 1950 science fiction stories. But why I bring it up is one of the things that is underappreciated in science is telling stories, right? There's a reason why oral traditions have such a powerful impact on passing down cultural values because they're easy to remember, right? They're easy for somebody to connect to. Right, and oftentimes when somebody else is trying to share something, right, is they remember the story that they're trying to connect to. Right, they offer these nice ways for your brain to be able to comprehend and process all the information instead of being told the bullet points of lists or facts or dates or numbers and things like that. Plus, most non-experts, right, non-scientists, get their information from stories, you know, newspaper articles, TV shows, you know, cosmos, etc., things like that, because they're in, told in storytelling mode. And it's a very effective thing to do. So let me grab a drink of water, and while we're in that, I'll ask my other little thing. Any questions? All right, Marquio Rubio thing. All right. Yeah? He did. Yeah, no, he was excellent at it, right? And he, and, and he was a great communicator of science, right? But he wasn't even allowed to join the National Academies, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the perception that needs to shift, right? Is we need to be able to tell our stories. So uh, I have a fantastic uh, PhD student 
uh, like somehow just keep finding PhD students that are just phenomenal. They end up with me. Uh, I'm lucky. So uh, her dissertation work did a massive survey of non-science majors, science majors across multiple universities and community colleges. And so what she began to find is the messenger is also critically, critically important, particularly for non-science majors. So what she found is she set up an ex a scenario set of experiments where there would be students, you know, young people, you know, high school age students, that they would be explaining science about air quality in this particular case and trying to explain why air quality is an issue, why you should worry about it. And what she found was that the science majors kind of dismissed it because they were high school kids. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, they might be doing it okay, but they're not sure. Non-science majors overwhelmingly accepted the students' explanation for a number of reasons. One is that, hey, these guys probably don't have an agenda. Is that, you know, they're, they're talking about this air quality issues in their community, how it impacts them, maybe it impacts me. And more importantly, they also found that the non-science people were more willing to engage in taking actions if they learned it from a student versus if they heard exactly the same thing from an adult. And then if we brought a scientist into the mix, it got worse. Because they wouldn't listen to the scientists at all, but they would listen to the kids. Is that impressive? That's so, I'm sorry? I have a question. Oh, so yeah. how do you uh, how do you how do you have the the youth come across as clearly non scientific and therefore not believable? Oh, we're gonna look at some examples. Okay. We're gonna look at some examples of how we do this. All right. So um, this is where we begin to transition into exactly that. So how can we leverage youth? Youth have a remarkable amount of power, and they often are told that they don't. And so what we need to do is work with them and recognize their expertise. So that's the top question up there. So what do people really need, and what are they willing to accept, right? Those are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about science communication, and how do we engage folks in doing science? So, uh, I like this example as one that has made inroads into Appalachia, Kentucky. So, one of the things, and there's an excellent article down here in the Harvard Business Review about the challenges of working in Appalachia, and particularly in working class communities, particularly ones like coal mining community. So, this is coal to code, and so what they're doing is they are taking former coal miners and teaching them how to code, and then they're setting up businesses on coding. Because you can code anywhere you want, right? And that they can contract it out and they can build their websites, they can build whatever it is that they want. Uh, it was set up by a person there who was operating a coal mine. And he, had, he, he saw the writing on the road, in the, in the wall, that the mining industry was on its way out. And so what are we going to do? So he, he was kind of, you know, Necessity pushed him. Ah, well, okay, what are these folks really good at? You know, they're, they have skills, right? And then they're tradesmen, right? And he began to think about how would you do computer science and coding, which is seen as this really hard, difficult concept, right? That you have to be incredibly bright to be able to do this. Is he sold it to lots of people around being a trade? And he goes, we work with tradespeople all the time. They have lots of skills. So that's how he began the advertising it. So he put his first ad out. He had 1,200 people apply for his 10 open coding spots, right? which is really impressive. Right? And so, and he constantly goes through and he says, coding, nope. We don't even use the word, right? It's we're engaging these people in the trade. It's just like welding, right? is that you, you need to practice, you need to be deliberative about it, you need to be rigorous, and you need to be thoughtful. That's exactly what the miners do. Because if the miners didn't do that, they would be killed. Right? And so, boom. And so it's now taken off. I really like this as an example and how he communicates with the people in uh, uh, Appalachia, Kentucky. So what we have been doing is, again, engaging youth in the same idea, is how can we help youth talk to adults in a similar way as what Peterson is his name who, run, who runs uh, Cold to Code. 
One of the things that we've found to engage youth and get them excited is they tend not to start their conversations with science. Is the hooks and the engagement is around social justice issues, environmental justice issues, things that deeply matter to that community. Right? And so one of the things that we really do is all of our investigations that we engage youth in is they're connected to some kind of social action because that also leads the kids to become politically empowered because now they have some evidence and some data that's directly connected to them, their families, their brothers, their sisters, whoever it is that they care about, and they have an argument to make. All right, so we're gonna see what these pictures up here means. Assuming, my, ah, there's my slide, did I skip one? I got some lag going on. Boom, boom, there you go. All right, so what you're looking at up here and apologies for those of you who came to the talk last night. The slides are similar because I couldn't find better pictures. Is the city of Boston. So if you're familiar with the city of Boston, right, is that we're a very much north-south city. We're very tiny in geography. And that blue line is called is Dorchester Avenue. So that's where Dorchester, Roxbury, those are the lower income communities of the city. Those are the communities that we work with for the most part. And what you're looking at here are two pictures of made in ArcView GIS. On the left is the kids were doing an analysis about access to different types of stores in the city. And they eventually got to supermarkets. So all the red dots are full service supermarkets like a Kroger. Okay? And the little red or black circles around those red dots are half a mile, a quarter mile, sorry, uh, walk. And so, can you walk to a grocery store? And if you notice, they're clustered up toward the north. As you head north in Boston, you get wealthier. And as you head north and west, you also, the affluence go up. So now you're hitting MIT and Cambridge over there. And then you hit the uh, significantly wealthier suburbs as you head in that direction and west. This right picture is convenience store access. And so, what you're looking at is, it's kind of inverted a little bit blue means that you have easy access to a convenience store. So that means that you have you, easy. That means that it's less than a quarter mile walk. So you're looking at a heat map. Uh, red means you have low access to it. And it's a little, it can be a little misleading because that blob up there, that's where Beacon Hill is. That's where the capitals are and that's where the financial district is. So there's lots of little convenience store shops that are in that area. But notice that green dot right there, that kind of one with the surface aren't many grocery stores in that area. So this is a food justice issue. These, these areas are called food deserts, and it's a little tricky on that term. So we'll just say it's lack of access to a full service supermarket, and, and uh, there's lots of arguments over exactly what that term means, so, but that's how we'll define it. And here's a little green dot again. This picture shows supermarket, supermarket access. Notice as you head up, blue means you have easy access to it. And actually, the full-service supermarkets there in Cambridge are all Whole Foods or Trader Joe's because it's Cambridge, Massachusetts. But then as you head down, look at the sparsity of those uh, supermarkets. And this is a known phenomenon. We know that if you live in an affluent area, there's one supermarket for every 20,000 people. If you live in a low-income area, it can be 1 to 40. In some areas, it's 1 to 60,000 people. And so one of the articles that we end up having kids read is actually a food access issue out of Los Angeles where they follow these eight women and it takes them 45 minutes on a bus to get to the nearest supermarket. So how can you begin to solve these problems? Then we have the kids do exactly the same thing because over here on the right is, do you want a car, right? Or do you have car access, okay? Now up there in the blue, uh, again, that's Beacon Hill, right? Lots of apartments. Um, Back Bay, it's the wealthiest area in the city of Boston, so you have lots of folks who don't own cars because they get driven probably most places. But then as you move down, right, less car access, right, lower income, no supermarkets. Some of the students that we work with, they would have to take two bus transfers, right, 45, 60 minutes for them to go from their home to the grocery store and back. Right? Nobody's going to do that, carrying groceries. Right? Carrying a gallon of milk would be painful, right, on a crowded bus in a tea line. So, what can we do about it, right? This is a social justice issue, it's a food justice issue, but it's also as much as an opportunity to help folks learn about science. Okay. So what the students have done is 
for the first five years of the project is that the students set up farmers markets. Right? And so they set up farmers markets in certain areas of the neighborhood. We work with City Hall on identifying locations and then we work with some of the local community organizations, particularly the community health centers, because those community health centers were the real trusted partners in the neighborhood because folks would go to them in need of help, right? A lot of folks didn't have insurance. They would provide free medical care. They were well trusted. So we could set up farmers markets in those neighborhoods. And then people would come in and then the kids got to explain all the science about hydroponics and about the science of agriculture, about the science, uh, the physics behind hydroponics, the chemistry behind the hydroponics. And the reason why we ended up picking hydroponics as opposed to setting up farms is we have two days of growing season in the city of Boston, right? <laughs> right. That's why visiting here in February, awesome. It's like 90 degrees outside. It's like 32 degrees at home and probably missing, right? It's pretty typical Boston. Um, and then they make all the documents. They come and they run workshops on how to build the hydroponic systems if they want it uh, to build something in their home. The kids now 3D print systems that they can give to people that you can set up in your apartment. So they're making all of those impacts as a way of communicating science. And it doesn't come across as they're telling science, they're telling they're solving a problem. Okay. So another work that we've done with kids is around urban planning. So in my background, I'm a recovering astrophysicist is how I introduce myself. Um, and so I knew zero about plants beforehand. I knew zero about urban planning. One of the great things of being an academic is you get to learn all this stuff. I now actually teach a course in urban planning and social justice. I, mean, I wouldn't believe that that would have been possible. Right? It's taken a lot of time. But having the kids lead this. So we work with local community development corporations. Again, these are trusted entities in the community that people know about. Their purpose is to try to make the community a better place by developing it or preserving green space or whatever the goal for that particular community development corporation is. Every neighborhood in the city of Boston basically has one and so there's about 14 of them and so we work with about half of them. So what we got kids to do is we, again, work with one of the local community developments, Madison Park Community Development Corporation, and they had this vacant lot that they wanted to have access to. How these things work in cities is that the city puts out a call, is that they own, the city owned the property, nothing was happening to it, and they, wanted, and they wanted something to happen to it. So they put out a proposal for community development corporations to come up with a plan to do something about it. Right? The community development corporations usually are working on a shoestring budget, Right? And they often don't have a lot of technical expertise. So we partner with a company out in Boulder, Colorado called uh, Placeways. And we would have kids get into the business of urban planning. And so they went to the site, they did all the field measurements, they, they analyzed the soil and you know, how polluted the soil was, you know, what was in it, etc. And so they came up with some various designs. They said, well, let's put a parking spot or I mean, a park in it because there are lots of kids in the neighborhood. And then they said, well, you know, maybe there's not a lot of shopping in the area, so what if we put in like some kind of little, little mini walking mall? And then they came up with, you know, one of the major problems is affordable housing in the city of Boston. All right, so maybe we should just get some more housing in the place so we can actually make it where folks can afford to live. And what they could do is they could run the simulations and the software package is kind of like a real sim city. And so it would tell you stormwater runoff. It would tell you how much CO2 emissions are going to go up based upon the developments that you have. Because you could tell it how big the apartments are going to be, how tall it's going to be, what type of insulation the building's going to have, all this type of stuff. Really complicated. It's exactly the same tool that urban planners use when they're engaging in their work. And that's what we try to do with kids, have them do exactly the same thing. So they come across as credible. And then they get to present, here's our solutions. So they got to present this uh, to the Community Development Corporation, and the Community Development Corporation got to include this in their models, and the kids learned how to make 3D um, visualizations of it. And so this is what it will look like. So they presented this. The CDC, Madison Park Community Development Corporation, put that into their report. They were the only community development corporation that had such things in their report. So they got the funding, $25 million from the city to redevelop the spot. It now has a grocery store on it that is called Daily Table. And that's where now all the kids' produce gets donated to that store. And that store also takes produce from other supermarkets. 
that they're about to throw out. And so you as a family of four can go there and you can buy a meal for four for about five dollars. And so this is, and then the kids get to explain all the urban ecology around this, right? Why do you have certain things? And what's the whole point of food justice? What's the impact of nutrition? So they get to explain all that science. Um, last one that we're working on is air quality. Uh, we do a lot of work with China. We're working with Chinese teachers on infusing inquiry-based curriculum into their classrooms. Uh, that's a challenge. And so these are pictures from my last trip, no, next to last trip, to Beijing. That's the actual air. <laughs> it's impressive. If you've never been to Beijing, don't go in December. It's the worst time to go for air. It's remarkable. When you're sitting in the airport waiting to go, they closed everything, the highways, everything. The only flights that could leave and land were international flights. Uh, and the reason why they closed the highways is because they were afraid of accidents because you wouldn't be able to see the cars right in front of you, things like that. Uh, yeah, my wife told me I was never allowed to go back because I was sick for so long coming back. You kind of lose particulate matters to your pores. Fun stuff. Um, but the same problem exists in Boston in some ways and major cities. And in fact, London, I don't know if you guys saw about a week ago, London's air quality was actually worse than Beijing's. So, forward. All right. There. All right, looks like I may have to use a computer from here on out. So this is one of my favorite quotes that I use from students. Uh, we get students in our programs that we run at BC from seventh grade all the way up to 12th grade, and we keep them in the program. Um, and then they get into college, and then hopefully they graduate from college. And so as we were introducing the project to students, is this was a question when we shared some of this data. This is an asthma map of Boston. Is and they were looking at the data and he just came to this epiphany and he said, you mean it matters where I live on whether I'm gonna get asthma or not? Right? And the answer to that question is, yeah, it actually does. Your zip code matters for lots of reasons, right? It's indoor air quality, outdoor air quality, lack of green space, or you're living next to a busy road, right? Lower income housing tends to be in areas that have poor air quality. Right? Even within the context of a pretty wealthy city of Boston, right, is that what you're looking at there is these are percents, and these are percents of elementary age kids that had to go to the hospital due to asthma. 25% right? of all Boston public school children have asthma. And so what can we do about it? Just a quick question. Oh, yeah. Small particles or large particles? Oh, that was particular. Yeah, that was sort of the 10 nanometer particles, or microns, 10 microns, I'm sorry. My nanometers should be really tiny. Yeah, these are the microns, yep, 10 micron particles. And that's what our uh, little dust detectors detect. There's a company there, we use Dustwinos, right, which is awesome, right? Like $30, they'll detect these little particles. They're yeah, actually really pretty good compared to uh, high end detectors. So we would teach kids how to make air quality sensors. Um, this was the first time we had to teach a bunch of ninth graders and eighth graders and tenth graders how to solder. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> Good. we don't have to do that all the time. <laughs> As, yeah, we had a lot of little burnt fingers and other things. Um, and so the kids would build these sensors. You can build one yourself for about $75, right? I mean, the tech has just gotten remarkably cheap. And then you can put these things out in various places. What we would do is they would get plugged in and then they would hang outside of windows at kids' schools. And then the data gets beamed back to us and then the kids can analyze the data. So we had a couple of partner cities actually doing this. As all the work that we do with kids, we do in classrooms. And so all of our hydroponic stuff is happening in classrooms. We're in about 500 classrooms with hydroponics. And we've got an environmental justice curriculum that we're about to launch based upon this air quality data. And what we wanted to do is how can you help kids communicate something as complicated as air chemistry and air quality to the public, right? It can be tricky, right? There's some complicated things going on. And so what we did is we partnered up with a company and uh, we partnered up with two cities, Boston Public and this is in Waltham. And we got these touch foils. These are little thin films that you would put on the inside of a window and you would project onto it and it would convert the window into a big iPad. 
And so you're walking down the sidewalk, we called it sidewalk science, and somebody would get the attention. So we made some really cool visuals, you know, all this type of stuff to get people's attention. And they would walk up and they could poke this window, right? Just the fact that you walk by and you see somebody poking the window would make somebody else stop <laughs> because they go, what, what, what are you doing? Um, and so that's my, uh, at the time, nine-year-old, as I needed a photograph, and so she got photographed for it. Uh, this got picked up to go into a business magazine, a fast company, and why it got picked up is now, using these little foils, we not only present visuals about what air looks like, but now we can also collect data on what people think about air quality. So embedded within this is all sorts of survey data, and people are just amazingly willing to take survey data. So what they would look at is, this would be one example of helping people to try to understand what relationship might be going on. So on the left is ozone concentrations, and on the right is tree cover. Is there any relationships at all? Right? And we wouldn't tell people, and we would actually let them go, do you think you see a relationship? Yes or no. And they would just pick yes or no. And that would give us a sense of what are people thinking about? And they would do this across those variables. They would look at demographics, you know, uh, economic, uh, socioeconomic status, such as income levels, right? Road concentration, traffic patterns, you name it. There is all this data up there, and they could animate it over time because air quality changes on the time of day. And so they would look at that. About five o'clock is when air quality gets bad, right? Because you got lots of traffic, heat goes up, et cetera, things like that. And then we can collect all this data. Right? So over the entire life of the project, we got about 10,000 survey responses from people in the community. And the nice thing about those little uh, airfoils or uh, touch foils is we put them at the public libraries, at all the little branch libraries, and we also put them at some of the community centers because then you can put them on a window and you can just peel them off. The initial cost of them were in the range of three-ish to four or five-ish thousand dollars, depending on how big you got it. And they would come and they go, hey, would you like help installing it? And I'd go, yeah, I probably would. I don't really want to break it. The guy came with a little can of oil and water, spread it on the window, and then squeegeed it. <laughs> it's like, we could do that. <laughs> it's just a squeegee to say not. And they could collect it. And so uh, one of the things we learned, and I don't know why in the world we didn't think about this, is you know nobody touches those things in the wintertime because we don't want to take their gloves off. Right? Even, yeah, we got NSF funding to this, and no reviewer actually made that comment. <laughs> like, wow, and it was just blatantly obvious once it got cold. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we go, why are the responses? Oh, right, it's like zero degrees outside. And so we got little touch panels, and we would set them inside of waiting rooms, right, et cetera, things like that. And the sweet spot in restaurants was right at the cashier, because while you're waiting, they would just sit there and poke them. All right, and uh, library spaces and things like that. So now we got some sense on can people do anything? So we began to find out that most people didn't know what they could do to reduce air pollution. You know, they go, or they would go, you know, the problem is way too big for me. And so we would have kids write into the interfaces, here are some simple things that you can do, and here's why particulates matter. Right? And it's interesting that particulate pollution doesn't impact your asthma as much, it impacts your pulmonary system because it gets inside and it inflames your arteries and veins, so it actually impacts your pulmonary system as opposed to making it really, really hard to breathe. And people go, really? Right? And you know, I swear, if I had said the same thing, you know, they would have believed me, right? But kids did. Uh, okay, last couple of things, and then I'll shut up. Um, some of the projects that we're now working on and that we're really excited about is we have a play that's launching pretty shortly on um, with a Watertown Children's Science Theater, or Children's Theater. It's a play on seismology. We had a playwright who managed to make seismology super exciting. Why it ended up being seismology is our partner scientist is a seismologist. And what's nifty about it is it's hopefully a way to get theater excited, right? And to get kids excited through theater by having them talk about science and then introduce them into science in a way that isn't so scary as a classroom space. Um, and now we're starting to slowly ramp up. We have an NSF grant pending that we're already starting to do the work of having kids write 10 minute plays about something in their community. And we're embedding science around it where kids are going to be using Ar Arduinos and Raspberry Pis to build the sound systems and the light sources and all that type of stuff. 
And where we really want to go with this is the idea, particularly since the election, of this disconnect between cities and rural countryside is if we could have kids here working in Boston talking, designing the 10 minute plays, then presenting their plays to somebody in a rural area, you know, Kansas, Kentucky, Texas, wherever it is, and have those students do exactly the same thing and engage them in a conversation, right? Because our kids are mostly worried about issues around police brutality, right? What's it like to be homeless in a large city? Right? Whereas those, the issues are different right, in a rural community. And our kids certainly don't know what that's like. And I would argue that probably many rural kids don't know what it's like to actually live in a city. And so we're really interested in that. And we're still looking for partners around that. But that's where we really can engage kids in doing, I think, some real good outreach. Because then you have parents and adults. Because we were going to have a youth science festival um, where we would bring in professional actors and they would perform the plays. Uh, this is a really cool potential new project. Veronica Robles is one of the most awesome people I have met. She is a dance instructor. Uh, she teaches Latin American dance and Aztec dance, Peruvian dance. She's from Peru. Um, and she runs the largest Hispanic dance uh, center in the city of Boston. It's in East Boston. It's right by the airport. So rent's cheap right by the airport. And she came to us going, you know, I've always been interested in STEM because she had learned about our hydroponics project. So we set up hydroponic systems in her lobby. And so we have a little display to help parents learn how to do it in their homes. And she goes, what would be great is if we could do something with dance. So my initial reaction was, that would be great. <laughs> how, how will that work? And so she came, she, trains, she trained us and my PhD students on how to do Aztec dances. Uh, Aztec dances are incredibly based in agriculture, right? So they're based on you know, celestial objects, they're based in very geometry, and it turns out that a lot of those concepts that are embedded within an Aztec dance, when you break them down, match the 6th grade and 7th grade Common Core math standards remarkably well, like issues of scaling, right? And so the kids make, make all the costumes, they make all the music, and they also have to teach the math to the parents who come to see the dance plays. And so we're probably about three to four months from really launching it, so we're still pilot testing things. And hopefully this is a project that will scale. The thing that gets this is the dance serves as the cultural connection point between the first immigrant families and the kids. Because the kids are mostly fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders, and so they're now growing up in America as a second generation immigrant. And so they've decided that, yeah, I don't want to speak Spanish, right? I'm in the US, right? I don't want to eat Mexican or Guatemalan food anymore, right? No, 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 right? Is that they really want to see themselves in America. So they're doing that pushback. And what the dance does is it allows them to connect back to their parents, the cultural heritage of the dance. And now we can educate people about math to it and why math is important. And even more importantly, is that those cultures have a really rich math tradition on their own. Right? And oftentimes kids don't appreciate that. And then they help the parents. You get to see parents go, oh, they had never really made those connections before. Right? But it's not coming from a science angle. It's coming from a different perspective. Right? And they're not pushing the science. They're not pushing the math. It's just the context around which they can do that. Um, why this all matters is this is a little graph. We only spent 18% of our time in school. Everything else is out of school. I know from your guys graduate students go, really? Uh, really? Are you sure there's not like a nine in front of that 18? Um, but look at all this time post uh, school, right? There's just not much, right? So that is where almost all our science education happens in very small dots. And all those little dots are kind of infusions of science throughout. So this is why we think we can leverage kids to serve as the ambassadors around science. So when you're starting on this, it can always be a little overwhelming. Is I always tell folks, read Don't Be Such a Scientist. Uh, reading the book actually made me a much better teacher on how I present information. Right? And now start lectures with kittens. <laughs> uh, can't beat that. And then this book on trust and confidence at the interfaces of life sciences and society came out in 2015. Excellent book on how do you communicate science and how do you build those trustworthy components. And a lot of the talk I borrowed from the research that was embedded within this book, it was a workshop. 
And so the number one thing that you just need to do is you just need to listen. And I'm going to close, just for time purposes here, with a Neil deGrasse Tyson's talk. Have you guys seen the Neil deGrasse Tyson versus Richard Dawkins talk over evolution? Is I think he sums it up immensely well. And let me see if I've got sound. I do not. Now I do. Let's see. All right. All right. So is there an audio thing? Yeah, uh, it volumes up. Oh. oh. All right. How many physicists does it take to actually have a sound? It did work yesterday. Let's see. Of course, we say it worked yesterday because it actually did. <laughs> huh. That's really weird. Let me double check down here. Oh, no, it says speakers, but it says that was muted. Let me try that. Oh, wait. Let's see if that works. Yeah. Yeah, we lost it. Oh, that didn't work. Oh, I got audio, even connected to headphones. All right, let's see if it works outside of PowerPoint. Got to love being able to YouTube Dyson versus or uh, Dawkins versus Tyson. I tell Dyson. That's a different person. Yeah, that's a different person. Yeah, there's spheres involved with that. Uh, I can't spell Dawkins. How about that? Yeah, feedback. Yeah, feedback. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, now we're relying upon internet access. Come on, cats. <laughs> or you could just believe me, Google. <laughs> trust me. Yeah, trust me. Yeah, I, yeah. let them tell you what's going on. Um, is that this is a worthwhile video to watch. It's only two minutes. It's, it's Richard Dawkins arguing with Neil deGrasse Tyson over how he's arguing about evolution. All right, have you ever heard Richard Dawkins talk? Ooh. Yeah. So anyway, it'll play in the background. Is how um, blunt Dawkins is, right? Yeah, all right, maybe we'll pause. <laughs> and Tyson makes a lot of the same arguments here that we made throughout this talk. Is Step one is just listen, because Dawkins in many ways is being harmful toward the cause of helping evolution become more... The question, um, and this gets back a little to what Francisco was getting at, you're a professor at a public art yeah. I was in the back row as you spoke. I got one last comment on, on, on Richard Dawkins, it'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> I was in the back row as you spoke, um, and so I could see sort of the whole room as the words came out of your mouth. And as beautifully as they always do, and as articulately as they always do. And let me just say, your commentary had a sharpness of teeth that I had not even projected for you. Uh, it was it's more, more, I had, this is my first time meeting uh, 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 medium, and so, and I, and, and so I felt you more than I heard you. And I asked the question, um, and this gets back a little to what Francisco was getting at. 
you're a professor of the public understanding of science, not professor of delivering truth to the public. And these are two different exercises. One of them is you put the truth out there, and like you said, they either buy your book or they don't. Well, that's not being an educator. That's just putting it out there. Being an educator is part is not only getting the truth right, but there's got to be an act of persuasion in there as well. Persuasion isn't always here's the facts, you're either an idiot or you're not. It's it's here are the facts and here is and here is a sensitivity to your state of mind, and it's the facts plus the sensitivity when convolved together creates impact. And I worry that your your methods and your 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 how 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 articulately barred you can be ends up simply being ineffective when, when you have much more power of influence than what is currently reflected in your output. I gratefully accept the rebuke. Um, <laughs> um, I, just just one, one anecdote to show that I'm not the worst in this thing. Um, a, um, a former and highly successful editor of New Scientist magazine, who actually built up New Scientist to great new heights, was asked, what is your philosophy at New Scientist? And he said, our philosophy at New Scientist is this. Science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. <laughs> can I have one last comment on, on, on this? All right. So on that, we will end. Uh, I greatly appreciate you guys sitting here and listening to me for the last hour. Um, this is about the worst way to possibly do instruction, right? And you guys were super patient. <laughs>